The familiar story of California begins with the promise of the frontier, an unspoiled wilderness, majestic beauty, riches beyond compare. For an eager world, this story offered fresh hope and opportunity. For a growing country, destiny manifest. For all, her bounty, her astonishing natural beauty meant freedom, fortune, never-ending progress. The popular story of California, the California dream, is a delusion. The pristine, natural world it celebrates is largely gone, torn into pieces and transformed into some of the most artificial environments anywhere on the planet. And the original residents, the native plants and animals, have been evicted, plunging the entire system into environmental decay. But what if the apparent conflict between humans and nature was no conflict at all, but merely a viewpoint, a worn out perspective? What if that dilemma was really an opportunity to reconcile both the needs of nature with the demands of civilization? When you approach the problem that way, that the world can support both human civilization and wild things, you start to come up with answers. We need to bring nature home. Understand what the future is going to bring and adapt to that future in a way that benefits both humans and nature. In California, a new story of environmental change is emerging. It is a story that tells how nature and civilization are no longer adversaries, but partners. Together creating healthy, sustainable environments amidst vibrant economies. Here, on America's western edge, the frontier's end is really a new beginning to an evolving story of becoming California. This program was made possible by a grant from the National Science Foundation where discoveries begin. And by California State University, Sacramento. Redefining the possible today for a sustainable tomorrow. And by California State Parks, a gift from the people to the people of California for 150 years. And by the Redwood Science Project, a member of the California Science Project. Additional funding provided by San Diego Gas and Electric and the Sawson Fund, as well as these generous contributors. California is often seen as a realm of infinite wilderness. In reality, it is the most urban state in the country and the most ecologically threatened. It wasn't always so. Natural California, pre-human California, is an epic of continuous environmental change, raging across more than 250 million years.
Understanding California's natural history, how it came to be and how it functions, not only explains its distant past, but is the key to its sustainable future. California is an assemblage of rocks that began somewhere else, mostly out in the ocean, and they've been assembled here in a complicated way. Eldridge Moores searches for pieces of California's geologic puzzle, a complex puzzle that is far from complete. This is where a major plate boundary has existed since 250 million years, and that's where action has taken place and things have moved around. And it's changing all the time and will continue, as far as we know, as far as we can tell. It will continue for tens of millions of years after, after we're gone. And the configuration of things will change. Eldritch Moores is a revolutionary. He challenged California's geologic puzzle, sought to answer its apparent chaos, and in the process, helped create a new paradigm as intellectually radical as California itself, the theory of plate tectonics. The theory of plate tectonics describes the surface of the Earth as a brittle shell broken into a mosaic of roughly nine gigantic plates. The Earth's core, the engine of tectonics, is as hot as the surface of the sun. As that heat escapes, it drives movement within the mantle, forcing the harder, denser crust to grind and tear relentlessly across the surface of the planet. California is a collage of tectonic debris building atop these plates. Early California was forged by catastrophic volcanic upheaval, the slag of colliding tectonic plates. Beginning sometime around 160 million years ago, vast amounts of oceanic crust were shoved into and forced beneath the west coast of North America. Deep below the California to be, great balloons of molten rock rose into gigantic reservoirs of magma. Some of that material forced its way to the surface erupting as chains of volcanoes that ranged from Alaska all the way to South America. Like many of the volcanoes that erupted during California's early years, the Lassen Peak explosion of 1915 devastated surrounding areas and rained volcanic ash for hundreds of miles. Lassen Peak is the largest of more than 30 volcanoes which have erupted here over the past 300,000 years. Lassen's unique volcanic features, its roaring fumaroles, bubbling mud pots and sulfurous vents, echo California's volcanic past. Perhaps the best place to witness the mountain building power of those ancient plate collisions is here in California's Sierra Nevada mountains. This ocean of granite is so large, it stuns the imagination. 400 miles long and 70 miles across. Bigger than the states of Massachusetts, Vermont, Connecticut, and New Jersey combined. And like an iceberg, what is visible is just the tip of the titanic formation that is 25 miles thick. Even more remarkable, the Sierra formed more than 10 miles underground, where it remained buried for 50 million years. 
It rose to its current height, almost three skyscraping miles high, during a much more recent and arguably the most important shift in California's geologic history. The impact of the enormous Pacific plate and one of the most dangerous tectonic boundaries on the planet. The San Andreas Fault is the eastern edge of the Pacific tectonic plate. It is the largest plate by far, covering one-third of the Earth's surface. 30 million years ago, the Pacific plate first hit California, but in a fundamentally different way. San Andreas is a big fault running down through most of California, and one side moves horizontally past the other, when earthquakes happen on that fault. And that type of sideways motion is the transfer mounting. We're just moving side by side. The San Andreas is not a fault. It's a system of faults that accomplishes that motion spread out over several different strands. In the end, the North American plate moves with respect to the Pacific plate, but it happens on a lot of different faults. Movement along the San Andreas Fault System is the main engine of environmental change in modern California. The San Andreas System has defined life in California for as long as people have been here, and in fact, long before that. The shape of our state is controlled by the San Andreas. All of our water, the fact that we have mountains that trap clouds, those are there because of the San Andreas. The oil that we allowed us to develop Los Angeles, that got people to move here and start drilling, are all trapped along faults of the system. So the San Andreas is California. The most infamous earthquake fault in the world is clearly visible from the air. Here in the Carrizo Plain near Bakersfield, the land looks like a rumpled tablecloth wrenched by opposing forces. The long, narrow Tamales Bay is another striking view of the fault. This flooded trench is the dividing line between the plates cutting through the northern coast. The western side, now a national park, once existed near present-day Los Angeles, over 300 miles south. Like San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, indeed most of California's coast, the Point Reyes National Seashore is riding the Pacific Plate, heading toward Alaska, one earthquake at a time. its land, California's climate is extremely diverse. North to south, the state stretches over 700 miles, farther than the distance between New York and Florida. Influenced by a generous coastline, towering mountains, and scorching deserts, California expresses more variation in temperature and precipitation than any other place in North America. Here, the land, the atmosphere, and the oceans interact in dynamic, ever-changing movements, a climatic symphony of many, often discordant harmonies. Despite California's climatic diversity, much of the state enjoys what is called a Mediterranean climate. One of only five such climates on Earth, it is said to have only two seasons, mild wet winters against long dry summers. California's annual snowpack figures prominently in both. The Sierra Nevada mountains are famous for heavy snowfalls. 
Strong weather systems blown in from the Pacific can produce over 15 feet of snow in a single storm. Across the Sierra, the average snowpack is 8 to 15 feet deep, and it stays on the ground for more than 200 days of the year. In all, about a third of the state's precipitation is stored naturally as ice and snow. The slow, steady melt-off sustains habitats all the way to the coast. The amount of water that's stored in the snowpack is basically what provides water supply in the spring and summer for virtually the entire state. Frank Gerke uses cross-country skis to check the state's water supply. He measures the snowpack and computes the water content. Today's survey? The depth is 48.6, water content 12.1. Is good news. It's 101% of its historic average. But the current snowpack masks a long-term trend. Temperatures across the state are rising, shifting the rain-snow ratio. More rainfall, less snow. And if the current trends continue, the Sierra snowpack may dwindle 25 to 40 percent by mid-century, shutting down much of the state's summer water supply and forcing a cascade of environmental havoc downstream. California's changing hydrology is a response to climate change on a global scale. Cycles of warming and cooling that transformed California many times over. There is no better bellwether of climate change than the glaciers of California's Sierra Nevada mountains. They do exactly what you think they're going to do. When it's cold and snowy, they advance, and when it's really warm, they retreat. So they've been a tremendous indicator of climate change. Geologists Andrew Fountain and Hassan Basajic scramble across treacherous boulder fields on their annual trek to Dana Glacier, 12,000 feet above sea level. These massive glacial moraines piled up in belts across the empty cirque are all that's left of the mighty glaciers that once dominated and sculpted the Sierra landscape. Back at the peak of the last ice age, the Sierra were entirely covered with ice, maybe in one large ice sheet or one large ice cap, hundreds of miles in extent for sure, and maybe tens of miles wide. So we've made it to oh, look at that. what's left of the Dana Glacier. Dana Glacier, like most yeah. glaciers across the American See, West, the has been retreating for the last 10,000 years. But by the mid-20th century, that slow, steady pace became a sprint. Recent change is brought into focus through a process called repeat photography. Repeat photography is the art of taking an existing photograph and going out into the field and taking that same exact viewpoint and shooting it again. It's really helpful to see how a glacier has changed through time. We could see if the glaciers become larger or smaller uh, and what the conditions on the glacier are like. Are there a lot of rocks? Um, are there crevasses showing up or disappearing? The repeat photographs that I've taken and others have taken show that the glaciers have been uh, shrinking throughout the past hundred years. Where glaciers once were at their full moraines at the turn of the century are now empty. The glaciers today appear small and kind of smeared against the side of the mountains. So uh, the change is dramatic. Melting away in the late afternoon sun, Dana Glacier is one of about a hundred remnant glaciers left in the Sierra. Ruins of a colder age. If current warming trends continue, all of them will vanish sometime in the next century. As ice ages come and go, the world's oceans fall and rise in response. At the height of the last glacial period, 22,000 years ago, much of the world's ocean water was locked up on land as great continental ice sheets. Sea level was nine meters below where it is today. 
California's Ice Age coastline extended more than 30 miles west. Today, California's coastline faces a different kind of change. Here, inside Northern California's famous Golden Gate, a tide gauge has faithfully recorded sea level since 1854. The data reveal a clear and inarguable fact. Sea level is rising. Sea level during the 20th century, global sea level rose an average of seven inches. That may not sound like a lot, but what we see happening is the rate of sea level rise is accelerating, and we expect that to continue. The signature stair-stepped cliffs of Northern California are the wave-cut terraces of ancient coastlines, visual reminders of change cycling across millennia. Paleontologists pick their way through ancient seabeds, searching for the fossil remains of shellfish that went extinct long ago. You've got a lot of oyster shells, you've got some corals in some areas. This whole land was all underwater. And a good example of, of why and what you can find is some of the formations, the cap rock that we have here. There's some spots that it's just a veneer, there's some spots that it's 10 to 20 feet deep. Uh, just amazing what you can find here out in the middle of the desert and telling us what, what was here about four to five million years ago. Anza Borrego Desert State Park may be the best place to witness the greatest sweep of climate and habitat change anywhere in the country. Five million years ago, this desert was an ocean, the Imperial Sea. Tectonic upheaval and climate change transformed it into temperate forests, great freshwater lakes and wetlands. As climate continued to warm, the vast savanna gave way to desert. Today, Anza Borrego is one of the hottest, driest places on Earth. We were surveying this area. It was on February 2010. The area that we're looking is five about a quarter mile. We had been walking up these ridge lines, down the gullies, because we're looking for things that have eroded out. And there was a little ridge line that you could see a bone that was sticking out of the ground. So then you're gonna jack to paleontologists, these badlands are a time capsule. The fossils they extract, fragments of the rich communities of life that came and went long ago. This is the carapace of a giant tortoise. Um, these animals like to wallow in um, a shallow, muddy um, bottom. And uh, so they, they lived in a very lush, uh, 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 watery environment. Buried for two million years, this creature lived in an entirely different world, haunting evidence of the tides of environmental change flowing across deep time. <laughs> California's diverse landscapes, its extreme range of climates, interact to create a dizzying array of natural habitats. Those habitats are home to more species of plants and animals, and also the most endemic species, those that exist nowhere else in the world than any other state. So biologically rich, California is celebrated as one of the world's 25 biological hotspots. But there's another reason that a hotspot is defined, and that is those species are threatened. So a hotspot is both species richness and the degree of threat those species face. Healy Hamilton is a biodiversity scientist. She studies how habitats and the wildlife within them change over time. Her research focuses on the rapid and nearly universal loss of natural habitat in modern California. I often describe biodiversity as the magic carpet ride of life. And think of that magic carpet as a beautifully intricate pattern made of individual fibers. 
the interaction that species have with one another that create beautiful patterns, patterns that are part of our everyday existence and part of our heritage. Things like nutrient cycling, water purification, creating soil. These are all gifts from the diversity of life that happen because of the pattern of species interacting. We are pulling individual fibers out of that carpet, unraveling. We see the pattern literally disintegrating before our eyes. And eventually, that carpet won't fly anymore. A tranquil morning off the northern California coast. The research vessel Muscle Point heads toward the source of California's oceanic abundance and its unraveling. This is where deep, nutrient-rich ocean currents upwell. We call it the California Current. That's the current that runs all along the west coast of the US. When the wind blows in the appropriate direction, it actually drives the ocean water to sort of push offshore. And as that water moves offshore, new water comes up to replace it. And that new water that comes up to replace it has been in the ocean, in the deep ocean, for a long time. So it brings up with it nutrients. We've had nearly a month of straight upwelling. The winds have been blowing really strong, which brings these productive waters to the surface, taken up by phytoplankton, and then in turn, who nourish the zooplankton and feed right on up the food chain. This specimen soup contains millions of phytoplankton, or algae. They anchor a complex food chain of astonishing biodiversity. But the California current brings not only nutrients to the surface, it also brings potentially lethal concentrations of carbon dioxide. The ocean is the huge sink for CO2 on this planet. Uh, there's about 50 to 55 times more carbon dioxide dissolved in the ocean than there is in the atmosphere. As CO2 increases in the atmosphere, more dissolves in seawater, triggering a chemical chain reaction and shifting the pH balance to acid. Here at the Bodega Bay Marine Laboratory, researchers test how native oysters cope with ocean acidification. What they have found is oysters grown in higher concentrations of CO2 and thus more acidic water are permanently stunted. Deadly disadvantages in the wild. And these organisms are suddenly bumping up against a, a wall in which their shells can actually begin to dissolve all right, rather faster than they can grow them. And at that point, these organisms are very susceptible to going extinct. Kevin Lunny motors through the fog that shrouds Drake's Estero, a large, pristine estuary at the heart of the Point Reyes National Seashore. Oysters have been grown commercially here for about 100 years. In Drake's Estero, most of our oysters are grown on racks where they're suspended in the water column. Tidal flow moves through the oysters and back. And so they experience a lot of water flow, which really helps for oyster growth. The Drake's Bay Oyster Farm was once the largest shellfish producer in the state. 40% of California's market oysters came from these waters. Here at the Drake's Bay Oyster Farm, we set our own seed, and we manage our own microscopic larvae. For many years, we never had to worry about larval survivorship. We set, and they lived. In the last couple of years, when we would expect acidified water, we've had wholesale die off. We've lost up to 30 million larvae per week. Oysters are a foundation species, ecosystem engineers. They attach on hard surfaces and grow into wild, three-dimensional shapes. The reefs they build create habitat for other plants and animals, the foundation of a complex food web that connects 
the deep ocean with coastlands. If we lose these shellfish that are the foundation species, we're gonna see a completely different community of life up and down the coast of California. Just inland, another important community of life is at risk. Deep in the heart of these mountains, shrouded in fog for most of the year, live the last remnants of a primordial world, the Coast Redwoods. My name is Emily Burns, and I'm the science director with Save the Redwoods League. I'm doing a study called Fern Watch, and the goal of it is to understand how climate change is affecting the most common plant in the coast redwood forest, sword fern. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 14 total fronds for number five. The reason why we're studying sword fern is because we think that sword fern is gonna react more quickly than the redwood trees themselves to a changing climate. And the reason is they root only in the shallow surface soil. 13 for number nine. So if we have stronger droughts, if the droughts last longer, sword fern is gonna suffer first before the redwood trees do. Okay, 105 total length, rachis length of 93, not fertile, has herbivory, and is old actually, super. With the threat of climate change, we want to understand if the redwood trees are going to continue to thrive in a change in California, and will they continue to make a habitat for all the plants and animals that depend on the coast redwoods. I like to say that the coast redwoods are the backbone of the forest. They create the structure that changes the climate within a redwood forest. They create the habitat for all of the other plants and animals that live with them. Redwoods as a lineage have been incredibly successful over time. They're on every continent in the Northern Hemisphere. Today, we find them at the smallest footprint they've had in millions of years. Part of that is because of large environmental changes that have happened in North America, and more recently, it's because of habitat loss. In the past, the redwoods were very well able to tolerate change, partly because they stand shoulder to shoulder and would buffer each other, I think, from sweeping climate changes. Today, they're growing in a fragmented landscape. They are islands in the middle of young forests and urban development. We only have 5% of the ancient coast redwood forest left. That means 95% is gone. This is very concerning because only having 5% puts many of the species that live in the ancient redwood forest at risk. Beyond the fog fence, over the coast ranges, lies one of the most unique and utterly transformed ecoregions in North America, the Great Central Valley. This 42,000 square miles is roughly the size of the state of West Virginia. When you look down on California, the first thing that hits your eyes is this extraordinary valley, this north-south oriented, 400 mile long, 40 plus mile wide, Valley. It's an extraordinary feature, more distinctive than anything, including the Sierra Nevada. This was an amazing biological engine. In, in terms of everything from salmon to birds to plants, there's nothing like it. Nothing even comes close. The Central Valley of California has the giant basin, the giant bowl, and it historically contained millions of acres of seasonally flooded wetlands. And those provided really critical stopping places for birds as they were migrating through to stop and rest and refuel. This is the central hub of the Pacific Flyway, the ancient migratory corridor that stretches 10,000 miles 
connecting breeding grounds in Alaska to the southern tip of South America. Prior to 1900, four to five million acres of seasonal wetlands existed in California. Today, only about 200,000 acres remain, less than a tenth of the original area. Beyond the troubled coast and the Central Valley lie California's deserts. About one third of the state, they too are under threat. Here, the pace of life is slow and determined. The lack of water discourages quick or easy growth. Newcomers labor to colonize territory and familiar residents struggle to hold their range. Barriers can be deadly. Right now we're on Highway 78 that goes through Anza Borrego Desert State Park. In Janine Colby is a federal biologist. She uses technology to hunt for the namesake of Anza Borrego, Borrego, the Spanish word for sheep. Got some radio telemetry and a receiver, and so if there are any sheep with radio collars on within this area, I'll pick it up and I'll be able to hear them. This segment of the population of desert bighorn sheep was listed as an endangered species in 1998. Our job is for this animal to reach recovery levels. So in order for them to reach these numbers, we need to be able to monitor their status, their distribution and survivorship. And so that's what I do. Okay, I'm looking at three ewes. Two of them just stood up. They've been bedded down on a rock up there. Supremely adapted to harsh desert conditions, these animals can survive for months without a drink of water. The population of 900 or so live in the steep rocky mountaintops that range into Baja California, habitat islands in a sea of desert bounded by human development. This population is geographically isolated from the rest of the United States populations by human development. Cities and towns and golf courses and highways, ranches and developments, these things have basically cut off the age-old movement corridors that these bighorn used to co-mingle with other subpopulations. The rate of environmental change is accelerating Natural habitat is shrinking. The 460,000 acres of wilderness here may be the last refuge of the peninsular bighorn sheep. Face it, it's the loss of habitat which leads to most endangered species. So again, it comes back to the problem that if we can keep the habitat intact, then this animal can persist and actually be a symbol, a nice symbol of a, what's really a form of wilderness out here. But if it goes the other direction, um, they could be the canary in the coal mine. Extinction is a natural process. It is the shadow face of nature's restless cycle of life, death, and renewal. What makes extinctions unusual is not whether they happen, but their speed and scope. The world has known five separate mass extinction events. Each time, much of the world's life was snuffed out by sudden global catastrophe. We are looking at a sixth mass extinction on the face of the Earth today, that we're looking at rates of extinction that are 100 to 10,000 times higher than the ordinary background rates of extinction that life usually experiences. Scientists call the current era the Anthropocene, the age of humans. If current trends continue, Rosenzweig and others fear it might more aptly be called the era mosaic, the age of loneliness. 
the extinction event, the mass extinction event that has already begun is quite different from any of the ones that preceded it. They were all caused by some kind of a massive tragedy, a pulse, a terrible cataclysmic event that happened like the striking of the earth by a meteorite, and then it was over. This one's different. This comes about because of the success of human beings, because of our ability to deprive life of its habitats, take land and sea and water away from the world of nature. And we don't do that uh, in an hour or two hours. We do it by the inexorable rollout of civilization over the course of centuries. And we keep doing it, and it never stops. And life has to find a new balance point. High above the normal tree line, clenched against the eastern limit of California, dwell the ancient bristlecone pines, the oldest living creatures on Earth. Many of these trees took root when the Egyptian pyramids were built, mature by the time of Christ. The oldest are more than 4,700 years old. Most of this extremely dense wood, what we can actually see, is dead. It's a superstructure, not unlike a coral, that supports and protects the thin ribbon of life within. A wild, prophetic force of nature, the bristlecone pines are survivors. They persist largely because humans have not disturbed them. The rest of the natural world must endure a very different fate. California is the stuff of fairy tales. Pioneer protagonist seeks fortune in a faraway land. Straw is spun into gold. The stories follow a central theme, the transformation of the natural world from something wild and beautiful into a machine. The plots are bold, heroic even, but there is always a disturbing twist. The adventures that changed wild California to a world-class economy now threaten the environment and much of the life within it. The California dream has become a nightmare. Exploitation of the natural world is often thought to be the obsession of modern humans, but it may instead reflect a basic human trait going back to the dawn of time. There's absolutely no question that native Californians manipulated the environment to their advantage. They practice controlled burning on a regular basis. They use that to 
increase the diversity of California landscapes, encourage the growth of species that were useful to them. They had sophisticated cultures, complex adaptations. They understood their environment. They manipulated it to their advantage. The evidence for their occupation is everywhere. Overall, the pattern of early human habitation was amazingly prescient. Soon after humans first entered California 13,000 years ago, virtually all of California was colonized by wave upon wave of immigrants speaking up to 80 different languages. Prehistoric California contained more people with a greater ethnic mix than any other region in North America. So this is a, uh, the remnants of, a, of an aboriginal structure. It's the rock footing for a brush covered hut. And we're standing here at a little over 11,000 feet, which makes this one of the most remarkable sites in Western North America because it's so high and because it's being used residentially. So this would house a family. And uh, if you look around out here, there's, it looks like there's not a lot to eat. Uh, and especially at this elevation, plants are really challenged. They don't do very well. It's above the tree line. Well, and that means trees can't survive here. So what that tells you something that, that pretty basic is, is that certain life forms just can't exist here. Why did prehistoric people live here, one of the most forbidding places in California? Archaeologists like Bob Bettinger suggest pressure, the pressure of too many people competing for too few resources, forced people into less desirable regions. We use the slogan, last in, first out. So as conditions get difficult, we sort of add less and less attractive alternatives. So the White Mountains are, without a doubt, the last resource, the last environment in, the last residential place in. And that's because it's not the last best place, it's the last bad place. Centuries later, Europeans sought paradise far off in the West. It would be an exotic and wondrous place of everlasting youth, vitality, riches without end. A 16th century romantic novelist imagined it as an island laden with gold called California. Despite 200 years of Spanish occupation, California's gold was never found. And by the late 1700s, control of the vast territory slipped to a chain of quasi-religious outposts, the Franciscan missions. The mission system brought a wave of transformation so complete that today it is often seen as the heart of California folk history. Beyond the red tile roofs and garden patios, is a changed environment of cattle and sheep husbandry, large-scale irrigated agriculture, and a riot of non-native plants. This is an example of one of the most massive vegetation type conversions that you can find in the planet. In California, beginning in, at the end of the 1700s, when the Spaniards were moving into this area, they introduced a whole range of exotic annual grasses from the Mediterranean region that have pretty much completely taken over the vegetation type. The domesticated livestock the Spanish brought to California were the perfect vector of change. Packed in their hooves, spread in their feces, were the seeds of non-native annuals, plants that live and die in a single season and able to regenerate with abandon. This is wild oats. It's probably one of the first plants to move into the Central Valley. In fact, there are diaries from some of the explorers talking about basically seas of wild oats. And this is in 1820. So this conversion, at least in terms of this particular plant, um, happened re really rapidly. The invasion, combined with the pressure of intensive cattle ranching in later eras, was more than the suite of native herbs and grasses could withstand. They have been completely eliminated. They, it's, it's, it's an ecosystem that's pretty much extinct. There are patches here and there, but there's a huge component of a lot of these introduced 
non-native species in there. So as an ecosystem or as a habitat, it's gone. The Golden Hills of California, for many the iconic landscape of California, is not really Californian at all. It is a landscape invaded by Mediterranean and Asiatic weeds. The iconic landscape of change. The story of the curious discovery in the winter of 1848 is so familiar, every fourth grader knows it by heart. A laborer toiling in the mill race of a remote sawmill glances down at a fleck of something sparkling in the rushing water. The gold rush cannot be overstated in terms of its importance. The gold rush Americanized California. It gave to California what the historian Herbert Howe Bancroft called a rapid, monstrous maturity. The gold rush set new standards for California in the sheer number of people, the scale and power of technology, and the outright conversion of the natural world into money. The frenzy brought fortune seekers dreaming of rivers overflowing with gold. Instead, most found riverbanks overrun with miners. Faced with ever-dwindling prospects, they turned to technology. If you look at the DNA code of California, it's the interface of nature and technology. The gold rush was an epic of technology, and as such, it has to be seen as one of the two founding principles of California. California as natural environment, and California as man-made, human-made, human-conducted enterprise. Uh, and the gold rush moved very rapidly towards complexity and towards exploitation. It was just one person to pan for gold. It was two to rock a rocking tom. It was four or five or six or 10 to set up a canal and divert some water. Each innovation required increasing degrees of cooperation and venture capital. Technology created a positive feedback loop. As wilderness mining became more advanced, more profitable, more venture capitalists invested, the California gold rush was instant free enterprise. That metaphor, that polarity, that DNA code had entered into the California experience and stayed there uh, for the next 150 years. Well, the ethos of California in the 19th century is get rich quick. Certainly, uh, after the gold rush, I mean, the idea in people's heads when they came here was to get rich quick. But it's also true that as soon as you establish a fully capitalist market, monetized economy, that the idea of getting rich quick becomes a social idea, thoroughly established in everybody's minds. And some people do it, therefore it becomes the ideal. Like mining, the timber industry in California followed the familiar pattern, a rush to convert natural habitat into personal wealth. Fir and pine were exploited early, followed by the giant redwoods. Initially, it took a crew of three men five days or more to fell just one of the enormous trees. Extraction with teams of oxen was tedious and limited to areas close to riverbanks. The steam engine revolutionized the industry. Steam-powered sawmills boiled up the coast productivity exploded. Ironically, the more efficient methods, absent any restraint or regulation, produced enormous waste and a glut of product that kept profits abysmally low. Nowhere was the impact of unregulated exploitation more obvious than in California's fisheries. When people came to California and realized there was a lot of money to be made feeding the miners, there was a, a rush for harvesting salmon. Uh, there were a large number, uh, 20 or so canneries built uh, on, in San Francisco and the San Francisco estuary. These canneries were uh, designed to take advantage of all the salmon 
coming up the Sacramento River. The fishermen were out there with gill nets and with other, um, other kinds of capture gear that literally captured almost every salmon coming up the river. At peak, 200,000 cases of salmon were canned annually. 48 one-pound cans per case equals roughly a million salmon extracted, processed, and sold every year. Obviously, that's not sustainable, and not surprisingly, they collapsed. Um, and they collapsed very fast, so the canneries were virtually gone from San Francisco Bay by the, uh, by the late 19th century. Um, it was a classic boom and bust situation. The this fishery essentially caught all the fish. Uh, so a vast change in the, in the biota of the system in a very short period of time, just a blink of an eye. By 1870, one industry had grown supreme, agriculture. California experienced an extraordinary wheat boom in the 19th century. It was actually our first great export crop in the beginning of agribusiness in California. She had very flat land. You were producing these huge monocultures of wheat. And you, so you had gang plows, you had huge harvesters, the whole paraphernalia of modern industrial mechanized agriculture. California agriculture becomes business agriculture, capitalist agriculture, agrarian capitalism, if you want to call it that. But it's run by business people. It's not massively settled by small farmers the way the Midwest was. But it was a business from very early on, and wheat really epitomizes that. Ultimately, wheat would be a mere appetizer to countless other crops with even higher profits. California's gold had clearly shifted from mineral to vegetable. Reclamation, in the jargon of the era, meant reclaiming wildlands and reinventing them in useful, profitable ways. In the first half of the 1800s, reclamation meant reclaiming wetlands, draining swamplands, building levees. In essence, removing unwanted water few recognized or resisted the destruction of natural habitat that went with it. By the late 1800s, reclamation grew to mean watering dry lands through irrigation. Water mobilization technologies developed in the mountains for mining were now applied to valley and foothill areas. So California becomes the most irrigated farmland on Earth, beyond the Nile or the Ganges at that period. And it depends on really two technologies. One is the modern dam. The second key technology of the early 20th century was the groundwater pump. We tend to think of the dams as the key irrigation, water storage, water moving technology. But it's only half the story. The other half, or even more than half, is the groundwater pumping. California's magnificent feats of hydraulic engineering would be temporary and inadequate remedies to the state's insatiable thirst. By mid-century, every river on the east side of the Central Valley had been dammed. 20 years of unregulated pumping had drained underground aquifers. Devastating floods, stubborn droughts challenged the great hydraulic society. The 20th century serial response was to re-engineer with even more extravagant projects. Californians turned to the federal government. Beginning in the 1930s, a new order of hydraulic projects, mega projects, were built for California by the United States Bureau of Reclamation. Perhaps the most spectacular project of them all. The self-sustaining Central Valley Project. The project aimed at nothing short of replumbing the entire state's water supply. In just over 20 years, the monumental Central Valley Project grew to become one of the largest water storage and transport systems in the history of the world. That was a tipping point in water development in the West, that we could move water between basins. That's a breakthrough. 
when you think about it, I mean, up to that point, pretty much throughout the West, and for that matter, most of the world, you didn't take water out of one basin and put it into another basin. We created a grid, like an electrical grid. We now are an interconnected hydraulic society, where events that go on hundreds of miles away influence what you do in any given location. And that's a pretty dramatic change, and that's all 20th century. With that feat of engineering, the Great Central Valley would finally be transformed from a vast realm of interconnected wetlands, grasslands, and woodlands into a gigantic open-air factory. By 1960, California would become the national leader in agricultural output and profit, a title it has held ever since. California produces more than 350 different commodities, serving up more than half of the nation's fruits and vegetables. Along with dairy, meat, and fiber, California agriculture is in a class by itself, producing over $36 billion of revenue every year. Amidst all the stunning productivity, is numbing monotony. Here, natural habitat has been sacrificed for efficiency. The endless fields of verdant growth mask a near sterile environment, containing about as much biodiversity as a parking lot. Near the withered end of the 19th century, Edward Doheny poked a hole through the dusty hard scrabble near the sleepy town of Los Angeles. What he released was California's other vital fluid, oil. The discovery would tap a gusher of transformation like no other. Southern California does not have a gold rush. Southern California has 60 to 70 years later, an oil rush. And that oil rush has a similar effect with the gold rush of intensifying the whole economy of the region, of bringing in new peoples, new workers, new modes of, of investment, and of transforming the culture. Southern California becomes oil dorado. By the turn of the century, more than 1,000 oil companies were drilling in California, producing 12,000 barrels a day. By the Roaring Twenties, production gushed to 850,000. At the peak in the 1930s, oil production topped 200 million barrels per day. With its seemingly limitless reserves, its many refineries, storage facilities, and ports, California became the largest producer and exporter of petroleum in the world. Plentiful, cheap gasoline was pumped into a new perpetual market, the motor car. Speed, power, freedom became the zeitgeist of a state on the move. Extra quick starts, extra power, and extra value for the money. S-S-O makes your car go. Happy motoring. In 1940, the world's first superhighway was built a motoring triumph that was soon answered by another California first, the traffic jam. Better, more efficient means of moving vehicles enabled society to stretch out, leading to the most enduring emblem of the new mobile society, suburban sprawl. California really invents the tract home. Everybody thinks it happened with Levittown and Long Island because most American history is written from the East Coast, but it actually starts here. California had the cars. We had very rapid access to the fringe of the city. We had the ability to mass produce houses very quickly, a very highly developed real estate and construction industry. And thirdly, we had the money. People were very well off in California. They had a very large middle class. You know, that means everybody down to skilled workers who could afford these houses. And then the finance, because we were very rich, 
state, we're going back to the gold rush, we had very highly developed banks. And you, so you could get the mortgage loans so that ordinary people could afford houses, because you can't afford them without mortgages. The mass-produced tract homes lured consumers who, by their sheer numbers, transformed the natural environments into something entirely new, suburbia. Post-World War II California was fast becoming the most urban state. By 1962, California surpassed New York to become the most populous state, and soon after California became the richest state. The post-World War II period in California witnessed an epic of construction in every dimension, in, in highways, schools, housing, public works, water systems, uh, an epic of construction. It was unparalleled. You could make the point that no civilization had built up such a vast infrastructure in such a short time with such success as California did in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Our industry is booming, our mass production industry. So you have everything from steel production, chemicals, oil refining, um, cement making, you know, anything you could think of was being done here. It's like our images of China today was being done here. And all those were pretty much unregulated and pretty much just dumping whatever chemical waste, effluvium, acids, waste products, just dumping them in the nearby watercourse or the nearby landfill. So it is an incredible tornado or hurricane of industrial waste that's just been poured onto the land, into the air, into the waters. In 1845, five years before California became part of the United States, the land speculator and booster, Lansford Hastings, promoted a vision of California that would become prophecy. The time is not distant, he proclaimed, when those wild forests, trackless plains, and the unbounded ocean will present one grand scene of continuous improvements universal enterprise and unparalleled commerce, when all the vastly numerous and rich resources will be fully and advantageously developed. Just a couple hundred years of development, exploitation, and re-engineering have wrought as much environmental change to California as the previous 200 million. Fundamentally and profoundly, we've changed the world. We've actually re-engineered the Earth's ecosystems. We've produced ecosystems that Earth never knew before. Um, so the question is not whether we can do that. Uh, the question is not whether we should do that, because we are doing it. The question is whether we can do it better. The question is whether we can produce some of these new environments, some of these new ecosystems, that not only are good for us, but are also good for the world of nature. And I say we can. Michael Rosenzweig is a world-renowned ecologist, academic, and the author of Win-Win Ecology, his treatise on reconciling the demands of humans with the needs of nature. He concedes that pristine nature no longer exists. Modern California is instead a legacy of human transformation where humans are not just present, but dominant in all aspects of the environment. Professor Rosenzweig admits the tried and true doctrines of conservation, reservation ecology, and restoration ecology simply aren't enough. What is needed is a third R, reconciliation. The missing strategy to preventing the loss of 95% of the Earth's biodiversity is reconciliation ecology. And what that means is learning to meet nature halfway. Develop 
parallel tracks for nature, in which nature can survive alongside of civilization. In California, this idea is being realized, even in places where the clash of civilization is not always easy to see. The Pacific Temperate Rainforest is the largest ecoregion of its kind on the planet, remote, vast, and seemingly pristine. But in reality, most of the forest land here is a legacy of intensive tree farming. The stands today are much like this, a monocrop of Douglas fir trees forming a tangled canopy, 50 to 100 times more dense than natural stands. The tall, thin trees crowd out the light. The understory is barren, biodiversity poor. Vulnerable to disease, windstorms, landslides, fire, forests like these are simply unsustainable. There's a real legacy of damage, but there's also a tremendous amount of resilience uh, inherent in these coastal forests. And so uh, what we've inherited is really an opportunity to test uh, the reconciliation of uh, natural processes with what we want to see from old forests in the future. So what's unique about it is our role, humanity's role in recreating those natural processes. The 25,000-acre Mill Creek property sits between the Smith River Recreation Area to the east and the Jedediah Smith and Del Norte State Parks to the west. Here is an opportunity to reconnect fragmented ecosystems into an integrated whole, to reweave a forest tapestry into the largest temperate rainforest in the western United States. Integrating Mill Creek into the larger watershed begins by removing the barriers. Well, across the property, there's about 329 miles of road. And on top of that, there's about another 600 uh, miles of skid trails and other fire breaks that were cut by heavy equipment. The process is very much like building the roads in reverse, and it's a very earth-moving intensive process where we bring the fills up from the outer edges of the road, and we put them back in the stable benches where they were originally cut from. A lot of the roads that we're treating were built 40 to 60 years ago, and the trees along the edges of the road that have grown in on the fills that we're trying to stabilize have to be moved out of the way. And those trees are set aside uh, once they're taken down in large piles. And then as we finish our earth moving work, we use those trees and that brush to cover the surface to protect it from rainfall, surface runoff. We're setting a stage for habitat creation. The, the, the slash itself simply protects and stabilizes the surface, and then the natural processes take over and recolonize these areas. Habitat creation, not just on the land, but in the waters. When it was an old growth forest, there are lots and lots of big trees. They fell into the stream naturally on a regular basis, slowed down the water, and created a lot of complexity. That element is missing uh, today because all of the big trees were removed. So what we're basically trying to do is reintroduce a surrogate for those missing large trees. These engineered blockages are now an integral part of the natural system and the key to bringing back endangered salmon. What the Mill Creek Project offers is a holistic and expedient way to address salmon's needs uh, over a very, very short period of time. And we do that by basically removing the risks, removing the sediment risk from the eroding roads uh, by reintroducing wood into the streams so that they have a place to shelter during high flows. Um, and by encouraging the forest to grow uh, as quickly as possible. Ironically, growing a healthy forest often means cutting trees down. It took a lot of people a long time to get used to the idea of cutting down trees in order to make a healthy forest. But when you've got 20, 30, 
sometimes 50 times the number of trees that would exist in the forest naturally. You've got to cut some of them down to promote vigorous tr growth in the trees that remain. And vigorous growth equals healthy forests and healthy trees. When we thin forests, what we're really doing is helping to encourage the biodiversity that would exist there naturally. ultimate outcome is not that we've done a good job removing roads or we've done a good job restoring the stream, but that in fact we've done the whole thing uh, and we've delivered on the promise of actually creating a, a reconciled ecosystem that is good for the forest and really good for humanity. The Anza Borrego Desert State Park is the largest state park in California. 600,000 acres, more than three quarters of the park is federally protected wilderness. Within this vacant country hides the unmistakable imprint of human transformation. Carrizo Marsh, once an open wash shaded by willows and cottonwoods, is now a thicket of tamarisk. A non-native shrub, tamarisk has spread throughout Anza Borrego like an infectious disease, choking out natural diversity. So I'm coming through this uh, thicket of tamarisk and it's just totally infested. Uh, it's impenetrable. It's uh, so thick uh, that there's, you basically cannot get through it, and it's just a monoculture of tamarisk. Scott Martin is a park maintenance worker for the California Department of Parks and Recreation. Although he spends much of his time fighting this invasive species, he's quick to point out that it was once welcomed here, cultivated here, the root of a brilliant scheme to re-engineer the landscape of Anza Borrego in the late 1800s. Since 1996, we have been systematically taking on watersheds um, and removing the mature tamarisk trees from those watersheds. It's a very slow process. We generally have to go in and lop off lower branches so that we can get into that main trunk first. and. Uh, we create a lot of biomass that we then have to do something with. In a lot of cases, we pile it and burn it. This stuff is very dry. It burns quickly. In all honesty, it's the most efficient way to get rid of all of this biomass. The war against invasive species is being fought on multiple battlefields and not just against plants but aquatic organisms, land animals, insects, diseases, thousands of invasive species, with more appearing every year. Left unchecked, they wreck California's native ecology, homogenize the landscape, and kill biodiversity. Some eradication efforts are actually aimed at getting entirely rid of a particular species in a particular place. Other efforts are aimed at containing a species so that it doesn't spread and take up more room. This is a matter of human values. Many of the species that invade are engineering the habitat themselves. And to the degree that we think that's OK, then we let it go. To the degree we think it's going to have some negative impact either to other species or to um, human resources, that's when we get involved and decide to do something about it. In Anza Borrego, the eradication effort may have reached a tipping point. More than 150 miles of desert washes and riparian zones have been treated so far. Despite the success, total eradication may be impossible. I don't think that this battle is ever going to be over. We have made progress, but every time I go back into a wash that we've already uh, worked in, I find new tamarisk. It's there, it's in the environment, and we are going to have to stay vigilant or it is just going to take over. We've reached that point where we can't just set land aside and, and call it 
you know, saved or wilderness or, uh, you know, a, a natural setting. We've, we have made our mark on the land and if we're going to try and hang on to the diversity that we know was here, we're gonna have to be a player in it and we're gonna have to, to get in there with our hands and, and do what we can to maintain that. California's Central Valley may be the most intensely farmed agricultural region in the world. It is certainly the richest. Wine grapes alone stand as a near $20 billion industry. A long tradition of clean farming, with row after row of manicured monocrops, has all but erased the natural habitat, the wetlands and riparian forests that once thrived here. In its place, this farmland has become a radically engineered medium for growing market commodities. Amidst this industrial enterprise, nature is welcomed back. Aaron Lang is a fifth generation farmer. He grew up and thrived among these vines. Like his father and forefathers, Aaron believes that being a responsible steward of this land is not measured in short-term profits, but in sustainable practice across generations. What we found is that farming does not have to be a perfect monoculture, and wine grape growing can be a participant in the larger ecosystem. Here, native grasses stabilize the soil between vines. Solar panels run irrigation pumps. At the new processing plant, photovoltaic cells power the winemaking operation. And all around, the hedgerows of native habitat provide a buffer and link to the surrounding wildlands. If every farmer could give five or 10 feet, and that doesn't take much, for one little hedgerow of California native species and to allow those to grow and to flourish, that's 10 more feet of habitat that would not have existed prior to that. Working with the farming community is the largest conservation opportunity that we have in the state of California and probably within the country. Rod Kelsey of Audubon, California, sees farmers like the Langs as his natural ally in an effort not to turn the Central Valley back to what it was, but what it can become. A partnership between profitable farms and healthy natural ecosystems. The benefits to this farm are real. We can demonstrate them. But imagine a renewed ethic for creating that kind of thing in the entire agricultural landscape of California. Imagine the 80,000 or so farms all putting those 10-foot strips back into the landscape and what the benefits are, not just for those farms, but all of that connected together into a larger whole. That's the challenge of taking it to that kind of scale and why um, it's gonna take um, you know, a lot of work. You guys ready? Yeah. All right, let's go get our gear. Here we go. Take whatever you're comfortable carrying. Local high school students are joining the effort, restoring buffer lands around the Lang Twins Winery. Right now I'm just poking holes in the ground to, so we could plant the mugwort. 16, 17, 18. 1920. The eager workforce is part of a novel California program that connects students with private landowners to restore local watersheds. This winery took away land from nature, and so what we're doing here is trying to give nature its land back. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> I think they can feel they, they have the power to make a significant impact on their landscape. Physically, in this case, 21 acres transformed by their hands. I think that's a very powerful thing for them to sort of be part of, to see happen, and to know that they have the power to do that in the future, in their lives. This used to be a Tokay vineyard here in this area that my great-grandfather and my grandfather planted. We could have replanted another vineyard here in this area, but we thought, what better way uh, than to give this area back to Mother Nature and extend this riparian corridor that we have here? What I marvel at 
here as this used to be a productive vineyard and now there's a lot more ecosystem services that this area provides uh, for the Great O ecosystem and for the Mokalami River. So now we have this very large buffer in between farming practices um, and, and the river and so many different things that are interacting that this area is now providing um, for the Mokalami watershed but also is providing, us, uh, providing those services for Langtuans. That balance, if we can allow nature to do some of the work for us, that's a win-win. It's more of a generational viewpoint, uh, and that generational viewpoint is to be able to farm the farm and pass that farm down to the next generation in, in a better condition. And that better condition not only involves the land that we intensively farm, but it also is, is the hedgerows, it's the, it's the habitat along our sloughs, it's the, along the Mokalami River. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's all of that, it's the whole picture. Because after all, uh, it isn't the vines that gives us our quality of life. Uh, it, it, it certainly sustains us uh, and be able to do what we do, but, but it's the life around us that really fills us and, and, and becomes a part of us. Like wine grapes do in the southern and central part of the valley, rice covers much of the north. Half a million acres produce over two million tons of rice and over a billion dollars in profit. This is prime rice growing land largely because it was naturally a floodplain. The loss of natural habitat was simply dismissed as the cost of doing business. And the cost was high. Not only did rice production destroy critical habitat, it polluted the air. For many years, the fields were set ablaze after the harvest. Thousands of acres of burning rice straw filled the valley with a pall of smoke for weeks on end. One of the great win-wins uh, for conservation and for farming was the idea that we could flood these fields, allowing the straw to decompose over the winter, at the same time creating tremendous wetland habitat for millions of waterbirds. These proxy wetlands not only provide food and shelter for migrating birds, they help the farmer by breaking down the rice straw and recycling nutrients back into the soil. Other benefits include weed control and recharging underground aquifers, all ecosystem services made available by reconciling industry with natural systems. We're now in a period when Farmers, along with conservationists, are recognizing that a more diverse landscape is a more resilient one, and by working together, we can benefit both the farmer and wildlife for the long haul. Agriculture is often sold as the heart of the Golden State. In reality, California is the most urban state in the country. 95% of Californians, more than 38 million people, live in cities. Not surprisingly, here is where the greatest environmental change occurs and the greatest opportunity for reconciliation. Like Many great cities in the world, uh, Los Angeles was built on a mighty river, but the problem with Los Angeles is that for the last half century, people have turned their backs and ignored this waterway. Pretty much all of Los Angeles drains into the LA River, so you have a lot of urban runoff, all the chemicals and urban toxicity. A lot of people really thought of it as a joke. Um, it was a lost cause. Because of the way it was treated, the way it, it looks in most forms, um, you know, also the way Hollywood has portrayed it in terms of um, use it as a movie set, this sort of post-apocalyptic landscape. So um, it, it's all about perception. The 52-mile-long Los Angeles River has always played an important role in the settlement and life of the Los Angeles region. But where it once ran free and wild, today's river is a drain. Its concrete-lined flood control channel serves a single purpose, to flush liquids as quickly as possible to the sea. Early Los Angeles sat in a floodplain. Unpredictable and devastating floods pushed officials in the late 1930s to control the Wild River. 
The celebrated engineering triumph eradicated natural habitat, grew a blighted industrial corridor right through the middle of the city, and fenced off the millions of people that live around it. All right, let's get cleaning. The restoration of the LA River begins with the simple idea that the river is a val is of value. And once you get accept that, all the rest of it flows from there. It's a way of gathering people down by the river. It's putting our ideas into action. My whole bag is filled with plastic bags and beer cans. And I found one lobster. <laughs> It's a chance to meet your neighbors, and it's a chance to do something good for your city. It's all towards bringing people to the river. It's all towards giving an example of how a community can be formed. The people of the river are, the, are a community, whether they're the homeless people under the Sixth Street Bridge or whether it's well-to-do people in Los Feliz. The one thing that they share is the Los Angeles River. You know, it's, it's the river, man. You got to come on out. You know, I tell people, Come on now, take a look, you know, open your eyes, expand your horizon to see something that the concrete has hold down. It's just, it's just, to me, it's Los Angeles Nature Reserve, the LA River. This is a schematic of the full 32 acre build out of Los Angeles State Historic Park. For Sean Woods, the LA River, symbol of the absolute control of nature, is becoming a concrete manifestation of reconciliation. About 12 acres of habitat where we can actually be bringing the river into the park and creating a habitat zone right in downtown Los Angeles. Each project, a pocket park, a commuter corridor, a greenway, contributes to a grand makeover, the reintegration of the sprawling city with its namesake waterway, precisely through economic development. The long-term vision ultimately is to create a 51-mile greenway from the mountains to the ocean for Los Angeles. If we can do this here in Los Angeles, I don't care where you are. We can do this, we're doing it. It may take us a while, but we're doing it. If we can do it here, then it's possible anywhere. For Angelino Melanie Winter, this river reflects the health and vitality of the region, not only the watershed, but the whole of Los Angeles. The LA River is one of the most abused and degraded rivers in the country. We kind of set the standard on that. And yet, when you sit here, and you realize and you experience what it was and still is really, and get in your head a vision of what's possible to have back. It's our lifeblood. It's the reason Los Angeles is. It's the key to our healthy and happy future here. Further south, reconciliation expressed on an even larger scale. San Diego is one of the most picturesque and fastest growing regions in the state. It's just a tsunami of, of pavement and rooftops. San Diego is also home to some of the rarest and most endangered species in the country. There was no way to plan for the future of development without taking that into account. By the 1990s, the real estate industry and the Endangered Species Act were set to collide. The point of impact was this tiny bird, the California gnatcatcher. It stopped all development in coastal sage scrub in, in San Diego and Southern California. And looming just beyond the gnatcatcher were many other plants and animals fighting to survive in habitat fragments embedded in development. The war, waged species by species, tract by tract, threatened to be never-ending with risky outcomes for all. It became plain that unless we did something at a, at a larger scale over a bigger landscape, we would have lost these ecosystems. It just would have been broken into a thousand pieces. Michael Beck is an environmental activist who directs the Endangered Habitat League. Jim Whalen runs a development company in northern San Diego. 
These two men, along with other visionary leaders, forged an unlikely alliance that ultimately turned the conflict into a solution, the Multiple Species Conservation Plan. At the end of the day, we ended up putting together a connected, cohesive preserve that met the needs of both the environmental community and then also the real estate industry. The MSCP preserves wilderness within suburbia. It covers 900 square miles. It protects 85 different species of plants and animals. And when it is fully built out, the MSCP will conserve 172,000 acres of critical habitat in perpetuity, forever. Now we know where development's gonna occur and we know where uh, open space is gonna be. But zoning is just the beginning. The MSCP helps developers through a maze of local, state, and federal regulations, one-stop shopping that facilitates everything from building codes to climate change. We now have 20 years of perspective allowing us to look back. And um, I can't think of a place that has been allowed to develop under the MSCP that um, was uh, would have been critical to the persistence of species. I can think of a lot of places that we've conserved that would have been rooftops, that would have broken that, that biological connection. Connection is, after all, the aim of the Multiple Species Conservation Plan, but not just connecting habitat fragments or reconciling business with nature. The greatest legacy of the MSCP may be connecting these preserved lands with human stewards. Okay, so we're gonna start up at this end of the plot, right? My name is Kathy Chadwick. I'm the director and president of the Earth Discovery Institute in San Diego County. Okay, this grass nice and tall is our purple needle grass. I'll kind of shake it back. The Earth Discovery Institute is a program that encourages people in the community to participate with conservation efforts. Yeah, this is definitely a bad guy and this is definitely a good guy. Volunteers are a critical aspect to meeting our land management goals. And land management sounds kind of dry. And what I mean by that is taking good care of the habitat. But the other thing that's really critical about having students and volunteers involved is that it influences the whole community and how they think about the land around them. And this land is my land, and this land is your land. And as corny as that sounds, I take care of my yard, I'm gonna take care of my backyard too. And um, I think the more you get involved with the land and the community you live in and the place you live in, the more invested you are in it, the more you understand it, the more you love it, the more you want to nurture it, the more you want to take care of it, the more you want to be a part of it, and the more you want to be in balance with it. And that's basically my goal, is, is to put as small a footprint on the planet as I can, and that footprint that I leave, I hope, is a really nice one. We're going to be doing things that will make a difference on this planet, in this community, in this world, and your job is to get your sleeves rolled up and we're going to learn while we're doing it. So it's, it's great that they come and they help and they give us their time, but we also create a core of stewards who care about the land and care that the land is there and care about taking good care of it. Amber, just keep walking. We got a lot of planning to do. So the value of that participation goes far beyond the project that's accomplished. These are our coolest grasses ever. This is our purple needle grass. Yes. Okay. Let's get one the goal here with our students is to establish stewards, stewards of the environment, children who take their science concepts and their learnings to the real world, get their hands into the soil, and then it empowers them to make a difference. I want to save it because it's all it's like just beautiful out here. It's really important to take care of this place because without this place, there wouldn't be any animals. It's pretty much like someone taking away your home. Like someone coming in and saying, this is my home now, get out. Then it's not fair. We're saving an area at a time. Just create more nature because if you don't, it would just be bleh. And I think that we can change the world because one million starts with one. We saved it! The biggest legacy of the MSCP is that 
our children's children and our grandchildren's children will know that this open space is here forever and that people did it in the 1990s. That 150 years from now, the wildlife that was natural to this area is still gonna be here. That is a phenomenal legacy if we can achieve it. The first job of a designer is to change the way you see. What if I could start to imagine a roof that can make oxygen, sequester carbon, fix nitrogen, distill water, provide habitats for hundreds of species, accrue solar energy as food and fuel, etc. What if I could do that with my, my horizontal surface? I can save money every which way, everywhere. And so I just think it's a huge lost opportunity. It's, it's an asset, a sun-facing surface that absor can absorb water, has been converted into a liability. A hard surface that just heats up cities. So why would I want to create a liability if I can create an asset? The gap? West Elm, these giant corporations and a litany of others are changing, elevating urban design, engineering life-affirming natural processes atop our cities. Not mere green roofs, living roofs. I think that's really what this message is about, is us reconnecting to nature reconnecting to natural process and life-giving elements around us. Paul Kephart of Rana Creek Design inspects his building materials, a wide variety of plants carefully chosen and reared for living architecture. The green roof or living roof technology, pretty straightforward now. The materials and means and methods are well engineered and they're figured out. Structurally, it's about the same load as a, a snow load or a tile roof or a slate roof. Not just adornment or superficial veneer. Living roofs are integrated within the building's plumbing, mechanical, and airflow systems. So that it's all a single organism or as an ecology would operate a living system approach to architecture and community. Many living roofs have replaced expensive, energy-consuming air conditioning and heating systems. Other economic benefits include rainwater control and filtration, noise dampening, UV protection, and more. Living roofs not only aid the ecosystem, they improve the bottom line. We're creating new jobs. We're making buildings more efficient. We're restoring biodiversity. So. These are not things of the future. There's a compelling movement that's happening now, and it's about the present. Reclaiming blighted rooftops merely scratches the surface of a growing effort to redefine cities, to make life-affirming eco-buildings as common and unremarkable as sidewalks. I think a lot of people don't quite realize how powerful the concept of city is. It's the place, actually, where nature and artifice meet. So when you think about it, why can't we humans inhabit it, and yet what we would call nature could be overhead? Well, that's interesting. So they not just meet, they celebrate each other in proximity. So when you think about it, cities can be far more diverse than the countryside. A lot of people don't quite realize that. They think concrete jungle, you know, no, there's no reason that we have to be that way. When I drive around my neighborhood and I look at how people are using the landscapes they have created, I see no one. No one is out walking around on these acres of, of lawn. Everybody's inside. I would be inside too. These are, not, these are not friendly places, and there's nothing to see out there. More than 40 million acres of this country is covered in lawn. 
Unbelievably, that area grows by more than 500 square miles every year. Bathed in pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers, lawns contaminate the soil, water, they carpet natural habitat, and smother native diversity. The Sinquanan of suburban landscapes is an ever-growing biological blight. Yeah, this is, this is all of life right here, one inch of it. A monoculture. So this is producing just a fraction of the food and shelter that used to be produced on this site. So it's supporting just a fraction of the animal life that used to be supported here. If we do this to the entire country, we will have no animal life. Doug Ptolemy, a professor of entomology and wildlife ecology, and the author of the book, Bringing Nature Home, believes there are simple things we can all do to change that course. The solution is we need to bring nature home. We need to bring it back into our lives, become part of nature. We are part of nature. Humans are part of nature, uh, but we have to act that way. And the best way to do that is start at home. If you don't have a species in your yard, then it is locally extinct. It is gone, and it is not performing the ecosystem services that it used to in your yard. You know, we have, we have moved in, we have displaced nature. Let's put it back, not only because it's going to enrich our lives uh, tremendously, it's going to support our lives. We need to do this. This is that full sun California native fuchsia that can survive on no water at all, blooms, you know, the worst part of the year and attracts more hummingbirds than you'll know what to do with. Taylor Lewis is on a mission to get as many native plants back into the environment as possible. He is the sales manager of Cornflower Farms, a premier grower and distributor of California native grasses, shrubs, and trees. It's a small-ish operation, um, but we've got big plans, big dreams, and a, a big job ahead of us. Cornflower Farms' big job is to restore the native diversity and abundance that once was here, something the non-native, the alien plants sold at the big box nurseries just can't do. If we're gonna to try to reestablish these habitats for our beneficial wildlife, you know, these important things that are this huge part of our ecosystem, then we have to put these native plants back here. I mean, we have the ability to do this. Just a little bit at a time is all it's going to take. I mean, it's almost immediate that you see these, these insects and the birds and the mammals start returning, and they'll find your place, they'll find your spot, and they'll find it as a refuge. I think that this is going to be what starts a little bit at a time. One plant at a time changes the face of California landscape. For landscape designer Roberta Walker, that change is accomplished one yard at a time. She works with clients who want more from their yards than regular maintenance and toxic chemicals. Homeowners who dare to trade their barren landscapes for diversity and life. My goal as a landscape designer is to create a beautiful landscape, a beautiful painting. But within that painting, it's sustainable, it works. I love the idea of creating something that's lovely but has all the benefits of working in the environment. When you create a landscape with more natural, sustainable plants, plants that belong in your region, you're opening up a conversation between you and nature. Nature is now invited into your space. In a way, it can live without chemicals, without mowing, and you also are invited to be in that space in a more comfortable way. You know, we literally are controlling what life will look like in the future by choosing what we plant today. And that is relatively easy to do. We simply buy a plant and we put it in our yard and that plant goes to work. All we have to do is, is select productive plants as opposed to plants that are not participating in our food webs. And now gardeners become the managers of our ecosystems, of our, our residential ecosystems. They can control just how much uh, life is going to exist there how many ecosystem functions will be produced there? We're gardening the world now. It's something that we absolutely have to do to maintain healthy environments for us and all the things that support us. So the, the ball is in our court. We have the opportunity to make huge impacts um, if we understand how important it is and if we're willing to do it. Change. Yeah. California's extraordinary beauty and immense natural wealth are products of constant 
relentless change. We're going to restore, remake this in a native habitat. Change defines California. It defines its people, too. We all make you a better place. More than 38 million Californians are today changing every aspect of the Golden State. They are the most potent force of environmental change ever. We're creating salmon spawning grounds in a suburban watershed. The legacy of all this change has been not just explosive growth, habitat loss, and environmental decay, but an awakening, an understanding that in California, nature and civilization are not a contradiction, but are actually interconnected, interdependent. So it's, it's high time that we do this. Everybody needs to dig a little. The struggle to reconcile the state's great natural heritage and its formidable technologies is the engine of future environmental change. An opportunity to correct the mistakes of the past and foster healthy, functioning environments amidst vibrant civilization. A great reconciliation. In doing this, I actually found out that um, not only am I restoring my community, um, I'm actually restoring myself, and it was pretty powerful. You know, every time I pass by, I can think about, you know, what we've just planted here, a seed for, for a better environment in our, in our community. I mean, that's just a great feeling. We all live in this one world, and we all just need to see that we're all connected. So this is just one aspect of helping the Earth and our fellow humans. For more than 150 years, Americans in California, and now the world in California, has been struggling to learn, to use, to employ, to cherish, to preserve California properly. I think Californians have always lived in the future. They've always seen uh, wide open possibility. The, the whole ideology of the golden state is about the future. Californians are innovators. We're technologists. Californians value nature. We've done so much to conserve it. And Californians are activists. We're engaged. We can bring all of those together, our nature, our technology and innovation, and our activism, to design the California of the future. Indeed, we have a very special role to play, but we, we damn well have to do it. We can't just rest on our laurels. We have to keep keep innovating, keep thinking, keep fighting. What that means is learning to meet nature halfway. Nature is very adaptable. And if we learn how to provide a, a reasonable ecological theater all around us, where we live, where we work, where we take our food and where we, we, we grow our timber too, um, if we learn to do that, then nature will invade with its own solutions, will adapt to those new habitats, uh, and will march on undiminished. And that is our design. And it's about love, it's about beauty, it's about celebration, it's about economy, it's about elegance, it's about security, it's about justice, it's about all these things at once. And whatever it is that turns your crank, go do that. Because in this issue, there is no right, and there is no left, and there is no reverse. There is forward, and there is full speed ahead. And when you hit a speed bump, you take off and fly. Inspired by nature, empowered by technology, Californians are bringing the diversity, the complex and wondrous nature of California home. And like change itself, it will never be complete, always in a state of becoming.
This program was made possible by a grant from the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin. And by California State University, Sacramento, redefining the possible today for a sustainable tomorrow. And by California State Parks, a gift from the people to the people of California for 150 years. And by the Redwood Science Project, a member of the California Science Project. Additional funding provided by San Diego Gas and Electric and the Sawson Fund, as well as these generous contributors. This program is available on DVD or Blu-ray. Visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. For more information about this or other Legacy Project programs, visit calegacy.org.